Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Last week we saw how important it is when a person agrees with God's order. It brings about godly activity in their life. And that godly activity brings about a change, a glorious change. It brings about the will of God. And what does that teach us? It teaches us the relationship between the will of God being affirmed, carried out, and the manifestation of God's glory. And when God's glory is manifested, good things happen. And that's what we saw. You'll remember that we focus in on a woman, a Gentile woman, literally a Canaanite. And we saw that the word Canaanite comes from a Hebrew origin, which means to surrender, to submit to. And how should we understand that? as acknowledging godly authority in one's life. And when we do that, submit to his authority, wanting his will, affirming God's order in this world, what's going to be the outcome? A godly change. One that's going to have a pleasing outcome. And the result is worship. Not a contrived worship, but a God-pleasing worship. That which truly is a response because God is with his people. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 15. The book of Matthew and chapter 15. We're going to begin in this 29th verse, and there's an outcome here. We have just seen, as I've shared with you, a woman affirming, receiving, submitting to God's order. And she experienced the blessings of God in her life. Now we're going to see that this submitting to God's order, his purposes, is what has to happen by humanity, the remnant of those who are left, in order for the kingdom of God to be established. And the purpose of this first passage that we're going to look at this evening has to do with teaching the reader, that's you and me, his disciples, what we should expect when God's order is received, submitted to, the outcome of the will of God. There's going to be a kingdom experience. And that's what these verses describe. Verse 29. And Yeshua, he departed from there. He came along the Sea of Galilee. Now, this word meaning along, near, it all emphasizes the location near the Sea of Galilee. And why is that important? Well, prophetically. And time and time again, I go back to prophecy. Why? Because prophecy gives us the lens, the vantage point, the perspective to understand the new covenant. So much of what Messiah said, so much of what Messiah did was all based upon him fulfilling prophetic revelation. And in this portion of scripture, it is highlighted. Pay attention to this word meaning near or alongside. It is the Greek word para and is going to appear once more in a few verses. And there's significance in the repetition of this word. The Sea of Galilee, according to Isaiah, is where the the revelation of Messiah is going to begin. His revelation gives an indication of what he's going to ultimately bring about. 
So now we have a foretaste of that here at that same location that Isaiah emphasizes. So does, so does this gospel account once more. And Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth, he departs from there. He came near the Sea of Galilee and he went up into the mountain and he sat there. Now, that word there gives an emphasis to this last phrase. We need to understand it once more from a prophetic vantage point. Think of the word mountain for a moment. The word mountain prophetically oftentimes relates to a seat of government, a place of authority rule. And this has kingdom implications, and we know something. The kingdom is going to begin when the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and I'm speaking of Jesus himself, when he takes his seat in the holy city of Jerusalem to begin ruling for those thousand years of the millennial kingdom. And now we're going to have a foretaste. What the next few verses do is to teach us what we should expect in the millennial kingdom, in the kingdom of God the order that is going to be brought about. And here's what we saw last week, and it's going to be repeated again to confirm, to teach, to emphasize. And that is the order of God brings about a restoration. It restores things to what God always, and I want to emphasize, what he always intended to be. But what was the problem? What, what affected this order adversely? The answer is sin. So Messiah is going to rule over a kingdom that, that reveals a restoration back to the time when sin is not ruling. Sin is not demonstrating its power. So he goes up on the mountain. Notice it's the mountain. It is emphatic. And he sits. It's a reference. What should come into our mind is when Messiah takes his seat upon the throne of the kingdom. Now look at verse 39. And many crowds. Now, literally, it's the phrase crowds, many. The term many in Greek can be either singular and plural. We can't do that in English. And that's why the new covenant, God inspired it to be written in the Greek language because it was such a precise, a specific language. So it's emphasized here that many crowds, not just one great crowd, but many different crowds from different locations, different backgrounds, they all came to him. And what this kind of foreshadows is many different people coming and entering into the kingdom of God as the scripture tells us. So, many crowds, they came to him having with themselves, notice this, they brought, in other words, with them, they brought lame, blind, deaf, handicapped, and many others. And what did these individuals do, these many crowds? They brought these people all lacking something, all reflecting an order that was not God's will, not experiencing his restoration. So these many crowds, different backgrounds, different cultures perhaps, they brought all these individuals, it says, those who were lame, those who were deaf, those who were handicapped, those who were blind and so forth. They brought them all before Yeshua. And it's interesting because it says probably in your Bible, they set them there, but, but it's a more intense word. If you do a good study of it, it's a word for casting, like throwing. And it shows an excitement. It shows an enthusiasm. Also, I would interpret, it shows a mighty expectation. So they, they set them and here's the second time, remember, I emphasize the word para. This word, which means near or alongside or by the side, 
And we saw it earlier on reflect, reflecting the Sea of Galilee. And that term, Sea of Galilee, if you look, for example, in Isaiah's prophecy, it speaks about the sea. And the sea in the last verse of, of Isaiah chapter 8, that sea is the Sea of Galilee. That's where the light, the illumination, the revelation of Messiah's work, where it's going to originate, begin. And now we see that same word near, alongside, for a different location. Where is that? It says, they, they set them alongside, by, near the feet of Yeshua. Now, get the imagery that we need to see from this passage. Being along the side of the feet of someone is a, a posture of submissiveness. It is not an occurrence by chance. There's great wisdom, there's great significance in that these great multitudes of those who were, were lame and deaf and crippled or handicapped and blind and so forth, they were all thrown, literally thrown, cast at his feet. Whose feet? Yeshua's feet. And when there's that submissiveness, that acknowledgement of his identity as the one who sits upon the throne, that is the king, Messiah. Remember, we've taught many times that word Messiah can also be understood as the anointed one, meaning king. And what did he do? Well, the scripture says in the verse 30, and he healed them. Without exception. They all were healed so that the crowds, once again, plural, the crowds, they marveled. They had never seen all this variety of different people who had physical problems, how they were in one instant, they were all healed. And the scripture says, so that, that means therefore as a result of, so that the crowds, they marveled seeing the, the mute, that is the deaf speaking, the handicapped ones healed, lame walking, blind seeing, and they gave glory, and here's the key, they gave glory to whom? God. But notice the designation here. It says here, the God of Israel. So important, why? The fact that it just doesn't say the God, but the God of Israel is most informing. It teaches us something. See, we need to realize something, that the word Israel has kingdom implications. I want to say that again. The word Israel has kingdom implications. And that's why if you are in a local assembly, a congregation, a church, where the pastor frequently refers to the promised land, the land of Israel as Palestine, this person is confused. Now, you may just need to go and, and share with him lovingly, respectfully, that the term Palestine, the origin of it speaks about a, a people who want to thwart, stop the purpose of God. So we ought not call the land of promise what the Word of God calls Israel, we shouldn't call it Palestine. And this phrase, the God of Israel, gives this passage a kingdom context. In other words, the fact that the God of Israel, and this is a future understanding, talking about a kingdom reality. Isn't it interesting? As the kingdom is described, Israel is used. And if we are going to be prophetically correct, we ought to also use that term Israel and not what is offensive to God, that term Palestine. Well, let's move on to verse 32, the second passage that we're going to study tonight. And this is a great miracle we've already encountered in the previous chapter, chapter 14, the feeding of the 5,000. Here, a similar miracle, not the same one but the feeding of the 4,000. 
And there are some significant differences to teach us greater revelation, meaning the feeding of the 5,000, that miracle taught us one thing. We'll review that in a moment. And this feeding of the 4,000 is going to teach us additional truth in order that we have a fuller understanding of the person and the work of Messiah. And that's really what our study is all about. When I say our study, I mean all of our studies. That we grow in our understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done and what he will do. That's why we're interested in Messiah Yeshua, who he is and what his work has been, is, and will be. Look now to verse 32. But Yeshua, calling his disciples, so he's speaking directly to them, and he said, and notice, there's a connection of, of what just was studied about this great miracle of multiple healings, of this great multitude of sick people, people who were, were deaf, who were, were lame, who were paralyzed, who were blind. There's a connection between. It's the same location. And Yeshua, immediately thereafter, it says that he calls his disciples, and he says, I have mercy for the crowd. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is what brought about this mercy? This compassion is another way that we can understand it. The word here comes from a Greek origin, which means to fill something in your, your stomach. And it's a word of compassion, a word of great concern, a word that causes one to act in order to, to alleviate the suffering of another. And what is he talking about here? The whole verse. Look again at verse 32. And Yeshua calling his disciples, he said, I have compassion upon the crowd because already, and this word is emphatic, already three days they are remaining, meaning that they are continuing with me already three days. Now, why three? Three is for the purpose of revealing something. And he is going to reveal an important biblical truth in this miracle of the feeding of the 4,000. So he has compassion. They have been there for three days with him, and they were intent on staying. They weren't the ones thinking about food. But he was, he said, and they are not having something to eat. So three days they witness this great miracle of healing. And in the midst of this, he's teaching. And he says, middle of verse 32, and to send them away hungry, I do not want, lest they, they faint, they collapse upon the way. So he is concerned about their physical condition. We've just seen a miracle where he was concerned about those spiritual condition, and now he's concerned about their physical condition, that they are without food. And why are they without food? Because they were so diligent in wanting to hear the word of God, his teaching. Verse 33, and his disciples says to him, now it's interesting, it's almost always the case that Yeshua, he wants to do one thing. He's thinking in this direction, and his disciples are thinking something totally different. And that's a message for us because we're his disciples. And we need to make sure that we're thinking as he thinks. Here's futility. Futility is when we try to get God to agree with us that we want him to think as we think. That is not good. What we need to do is beseech him that he would reveal to us his thoughts, how he sees something, his perspective, and that we would have a great desire to carry it out. Whatever he reveals to us, this is what 
we want. So the disciples, they are saying to him, from where is to us? And, and it emits, means simply, from where are we going to have? And where are they? In the desert, in that wilderness. Now, we've learned that this wilderness, whenever the scripture is speaking about the desert, the wilderness, it always brings upon the text a different context. And what is that? One of dependence, one of trusting, one of reliance upon God. And here's the problem. The disciples, they had a difficulty trusting Messiah, rely upon him, depending upon him. And you know what? That's probably true for you and me as well. See, our tendency is to lean on our own understanding. Don't do that. That is exactly what the enemy wants you to do. But trust, depend upon him. So the disciples say, from where will be for us in this desert? And then it has bread and then the word such as. Meaning, where in this desert will there be to us bread sufficient enough so that shall be satisfied the crowd such as this? And this word such as this for a crowd that size and the bread, that amount of bread such as would be required, all of those are, are being linked together. And why is that? Well, the message is this. They were thinking of humanity. They were thinking about the physical provision rather than thinking about the one who spoke to them. Now, this is a, a passage that shows the disciples' inability to mature. Let me ask you. Do you struggle with spiritual maturity? God, he teaches you something. He brings you into a situation. Sometimes it can be a difficult. It can be a painful experience. Are you learning from that? Do you grasp what God wants you to learn? So here in this passage of scripture, the disciples, they're thinking about humanity, the physical, the natural, rather than, than the one who is with them, Messiah. Verse 34, and Yeshua says to them, how many loaves do you have? But, and this is an important conjunction, he, he is saying, what do we have? See, with him, he can supply. The phrase in Hebrew is a very important word, lashlim, means to complete. That's what God does. God takes that which is lacking and he completes it. He fulfills it. That's his nature. And that's what Messiah is going to demonstrate once more to these slow maturing disciples. But they said to him, seven, meaning seven loaves of bread and a few, and there's a change. When we go back to, to chapter 14 and the feeding of the 5,000, it uses the normal word for fish, but here it uses a slightly different word, a word that speaks of little fish. So they had seven loaves of bread, but they only had a few. We're not given the number. In the feeding of the 5,000, we're told that there's five loaves and two fish. Here, not the case. Seven loaves, but only a few little fish. Verse 35. All of this begins, this miracle that we're going to witness, it all begins with him commanding the crowd to do something. Your Bible probably says to sit down, and that's fine, but it uses a unique word. Not the normal word, not the same word when it says that Messiah set, when he went up to that mountain and he set upon it. That's the normal word for sitting. But this is a word for reclining. And it's usually in the Bible understood as sitting to partake of a meal, a festival meal, a significant meal, a meal that you would have on Shabbat or the new moon celebration, something of significance, a wedding, a bar mitzvah, a, a circumcision, a brit milah ceremony, something of great significance. And the fact that this word appears in the text tells us 
what we're studying has significance. So he commands the crowd to sit down upon the ground and taking the seven loaves and the fish, and here it's the normal word for fish, he gives thanks, he breaks, he broke the bread, meaning divided it, and he gave it to his disciples, much like he did the other time. But, and this is emphasized, a different conjunction. Why? Because it was the disciples that, that gave to the crowd. And we see something. God supplies us and we give out. We become the vessel for the distribution of God's provision. So you need to ask yourself, God, use me in order that I might be an instrument to, to bless others, that you might use me to distribute your blessing to others. Verse 37, and they all ate and they were all satisfied. And they took, and this is the word for the, the extra, that which remained remain, the abundance, what was not consumed of the fragments. And what did they do? They put these fragments, these broken fragments, that what was left over, this abundance. And there were seven baskets full. Now, realize, in the feeding of the 5,000, there was 12. Here, seven. And I want you to see that there's a significance here. When we looked at the feeding of the 5,000, it showed something. It showed that Israel was going to experience liberty through Messiah to accomplish his purpose. But now this feeding, notice what the scripture says. They take up seven baskets full, and all those who ate were how many? 4,000 men. Not counting, it says, women and children. There was 4,000. Four is the number of the globe, the world. Seven and 4,000. The purpose of Messiah, through his order, he is going to bring sanctification. He's going to bring about his purpose. The number seven relates to holiness, sanctification, purpose. Messiah is going to bring sanctification to the world. Verse 39. And after he sent the crowd... He went into the, the boat, he embarked into the boat, and from there he went into the regions of Migdal, a different location near the Sea of Galilee. Again, Messiah, he did a great miracle for the purpose of revelation that we might know the truth and implement the truth in our life. Well, I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.